Um, you know, the reason women are rising is because women were left by the division of labor to look after the sustenance of society. It was assumed that men can be pulled out of the society and be sent to plantations to, spend, to run industries and factory. Women were left to provide the water, to provide the food, to look after children. So women continued to participate in a care economy. And in the care economy, they've managed to maintain the values of caring for nature, for community, for their families. So when the forests go, women of Chipko come out and hug the trees and say, you have to kill us before you kill the trees. Mm -hmm. uh, when the Bhopal disaster happens and kills 3,000 people in one night and 30,000 since then, is the victims of Bhopal, the women of Bhopal, who are still 25 years later fighting for justice. When Coca-Cola, who's... Posters are all over the airport. When you get off the flight, you see Hope and Hagen, and then the bottle of Coke, Hope in a bottle of Coke. Well, the women of Plachimada don't think that, because in Plachimada, Coke was exploiting groundwater at the rate of 1.5 to 2 million liters per day, and had left a water famine. Women had no water in their wells because groundwater is connected. My well is connected to your well. Coca-Cola's well is connected to the village well. And then a woman, woman called Mai Lama, who's no more, she passed away two years ago, she said, why should we keep water, walking further for water? This company has to shut down. And they had the courage to organize actions. They invited me to celebrate one year of resistance. And then I realized 500 policemen, 100 women. This was a very unequal struggle. And we put all our weight behind the women's struggle of Plachimada. Coca-Cola had to shut down. Mm, fantastic. Would you talk a little bit about your hopes and your expectations of what we can have come out of COP15, what your expectations are? Well, you know, expectation is a realistic assessment. Mm -hmm. And a realistic assessment tells me that there are only two outcomes of the formal meetings of Copenhagen. If the big powers win, then we will have a dismantling of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which means a retreat pre-1992, before the Earth Summit in Rio, a free-for-all for the global corporations that are destroying the climate, no internationally binding instrument to regulate them, and so-called voluntary measures by national governments designed to continue the corporate, allow the corporations to pollute. That is exactly what the U.S. administration is trying, and unfortunately and sadly even under Obama leadership, and all this declaration of 16% reduction, which is really 4% reduction measured on 1990 levels, um, is not a reduction at all. But the main agenda of the U.S. is dismantle the United Nations binding treaty. And they want to have a political declaration. A political declaration counts for nothing. It's empty. We need a legally binding treaty. If the third world wins out, the weaker countries which are facing the intensity of climate impact, the small island nations, Africa with its increasing droughts, if they win out, the only one way, the weak, have an instrument in the face of injustice, mm. and that is to not cooperate. That's what Gandhi told us yes. about Satyagraha. So a victory of Satyagraha would be, in my view, a better outcome than an agreement that is a negative agreement to destroy the basis of an internationally binding treaty. What's my hope? My hope is that the Satyagraha takes place. We brought down the British Empire through Satyagraha. <laughs> and the only way we can bring down the corporate empire is through a Satyagraha of governments as well as people. The movements here at Climber Forum or at Christiana are saying we do not believe in your corporate solutions where you take every crisis the corporations have created and hand it over to corporations and said make more money out of the crisis you created everyone has had enough of this they're assuming the world is foolish and stupid they're assuming the world is blind and deaf and the arrogance of these big powers is what is at test here in Copenhagen can you talk a little bit about of course food security being the highest issue but also the 200,000 uh, Indian farmers who've committed suicide and, you know, the loss of hope there and, mm -hmm. and how to regain that. Well, you know, the current industrial globalized food system is a system based on war. The uh, chemicals that come into chemical farming came out of war. 
They weren't designed for agriculture. Pesticides are war chemicals. Herbicides are war chemicals. Genetic engineering is based on war technology. You shoot with a gene gun. Why on earth would you do that? Instead of doing loving breeding, treating every crop and every species as having a subjecthood and having an integrity. Um, but this turns into a war against people. In terms of farmers, because India is a pro poor country, Indian farmers don't have the rate of subsidies that European and American farmers have, where $400 billion of subsidies are given that allows these corporations to sell the rubbish. In India, the farmer has to bear the burden. So when Monsanto comes in with GM seeds for cotton, the prices rise from 7 rupees to 1,700 rupees.